Okay, well, a very warm welcome everyone to this third webinar for Intvau's Architecture Challenge. My name is Harriet Wenberg and I'm Executive Director of Intvau, which is a global network dedicated to creating better places to live. Um, I'm in London in the UK for this session today and with all of you joining us from a list of over 40 countries um, and amongst those we have Albania, Botswana, Ireland, Mexico, Norway, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome to everyone wherever you're joining us from today. The Intbau Architecture Challenge is a competition for low carbon, no carbon and carbon negative designs for resilient and adaptable houses. Um, the design competition of the Architecture Challenge is going to launch alongside COP26, the UN Climate Conference, in November this year. And each month until next April, we're running an interactive series of webinars. And because the Architecture Challenge is about both words and actions, this webinar series is going to help encourage thought and discussion, uh, leading to greater knowledge and then to strong submissions to the design competition from participants who choose to enter. And just as a reminder to everyone thinking about entering the competition that as a second phase, we do also want to see some built tangible results from the architecture challenge. So we're going to be looking for opportunities to construct and test some of the winning entries in the contexts for which they're intended. So before getting on to more about today's session, um, just a few quick thanks um, to, our, to our sponsors, Ali Reza and, Minis, and Mina Sagarchi and Stanhope Gate Architecture. So today's session um, that you've joined us for will focus on unpicking some of the difficult questions that come hand in hand with any discussion of the future sustainability of the built environment. Our four speakers and question answerers will be giving their thoughts and perspectives on everything from carbon calculators, upscaling and standards to responsibility for change and the definitions of natural material and better building. So of course, there will be no single or clear answer to any of the questions. And if there were, if that were possible, then the ses session would have needed a different title, like easy questions or something like that. Um, so difficult questions. And today is really all about discussion. So I'm now briefly going to introduce our four speakers and more about each of them can be found on the Architecture Challenge website, which is challenge.info.org. Um, we're going to also welcome questions from you, our participants, to, to close the session. So as we go along, um, please type your questions into the Q&A box and we'll then put those to, to speakers towards the end. Uh, so bios uh, for, our, for our four speakers, starting with Jane Anderson. Jane is an expert in life cycle assessment and environmental product declarations for the construction sector with over 20 years experience in the field. She has previously worked for the building research establishment in Watford in the UK and has authored and co-authored multiple publications and editions of publications such as the Green Guide to Specification. Uh, next is Andrew Coates, who's based in Gamboa, Panama, and is the founder of Cresselus, a team of architects, engineers and craftspeople who specialize in designing buildings and infrastructure for hot and humid climates. Andrew has been involved in the collection of thousands of examples of good tropical design techniques from Central and South America, the Caribbean, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Next is Dr. Hans Friedrich, uh, is currently based in Ongozo in Malta, and Hans is a member of the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment and Development, as well as a global ambassador of the World Bamboo Organization and senior advisor to the European Bamboo Program. Hans was previously Director General of INBAR, which is the International Bamboo and Rattan Organization, um, and European Director for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And in 1999, also worth mentioning, Hans was awarded the Medal for Science and Technology in recognition of his work for the National Environment Agency. And last, uh, last on our list of four is Dr. Rebecca Rubens, uh, who studied industrial design at the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, India, and completed a PhD at Delft in the Netherlands on the intersection of craft, design, and sustainability. Rebecca runs a sustainable design studio now called Rhizome and has worked extensively in Asia, Africa and Europe, as well as publishing books and continuing to teach across design schools in India. And like Hans, Rebecca is also an ambassador for the World Bamboo Organization. So very big welcome and thank you for joining us to our four speakers for, for today. So I think we've, we've got all of you here now and with us. Um, and I'm going to change my screen so that I can see all of you. 
Um, and so without further ado, we're going to get into the questions. Um, so as a, as a first, um, wanting to ask, what are some of the difficulties and inconsistencies associated with defining what qualifies as a natural, quote unquote, building material? Um, and I wonder, I think Hans and Jane would be very well placed, um, as all of you maybe to answer this one. So I wonder, Hans, would you like to, to, to lead us off with this question? Thanks, Harriet. Yes, um, as you can imagine, I will talk about bamboo because that is really <laughs> what I know about. Um, and I think it's a very interesting question with bamboo. Bamboo is used quite extensively in, in uh, Asia, in Latin America, particularly for, for vernacular construction using the bamboo pole. And I guess a bamboo pole is certainly a natural building material, and it's quite arguably one of the most sustainable building materials because bamboo poles, although they look like trees, are actually grass. But when you go to Europe and the US, bamboo is used as an engineered um, product. And basically engineered bamboo is splitting the pole into strips and gluing the strips back together to create a beam or a, or a plank. Um, and then of course, all of a sudden the question is, is that still natural? Because you are using adhesives and there are all kinds of questions about how environmental is the adhesive you use energy to glue the stuff together if you want to make the the, the engineered bamboo very strong you even have to apply heat so all of a sudden your natural product is not as natural as you would like it to be and certainly some of the aspects not so necessarily related to construction, but if you think about bamboo fibers for, for textile, for example, the argument is natural bamboo has a lot of qualities, but as soon as it is manufactured, those qualities may not be there anymore. So it really depends how you use the bamboo, whether you can call it really a natural product or not. And that depends very much again, where you are in the world. Because I say, in certain countries, um, in, in Bali, for example, bamboo is used to construct three story high uh, houses. In, in, in Thailand, I know of an enormous uh, a hall in a, in, a, in a school that is made for bamboo poles. Uh, Simon Velez in, in Ecuador and Colombia makes cathedrals from bamboo. Um, but that's, that's you know, one very typical way of using the bamboo poles. As I say, here in Europe, it's much more engineered bamboos for flooring, for paneling, and for non-load bearing um, users. Great, Kit, no bamboo being a, that perfect, that versatile and perfect case study for that question. And certainly touching hands there as well on the, some of the inconsistencies that it, it, it depends on the context, depends on the part of the world and how it's being used. Thank you very much. And I wonder, Jane, definitely that's, this is a question that's relevant to a lot of what, what you do and what you've been focused on. So what, what thoughts from, from your side? Yeah. I mean, I think there's two ways that we normally kind of interpret natural materials, either as, as kind of bio-based materials or as, as kind of minimally processed materials like stone. Um, I think that the danger of both of those definitions is, is very often you need almost non-natural materials to get them to work. So uh, with timber, you very often need preservatives and, and they're not really natural. Um, even with with uh, kind of fibre insulations, you'll very often have a, a binder that's that's not natural, or at least is quite heavily processed. Um, and certainly with all of these materials, just because something is natural doesn't actually mean that it's a low impact solution. Um, you know, stone can very often have the same sort of impact as as brick, even though the brick is fired because it's very hard to cut stone and and definitely hard to polish it for example um, so I, I think you have to be careful and and not use natural as as meaning low impact without being careful to understand whether it really is yes makes sense and even in a uk context i imagine jane with your work it being quite tricky to find any standardized way of, of defining even thinking about each individual building project each city town yeah that might be I yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say whether something's a low impact product because you really have to understand mm. how it's going to be used in the building. You know, if you use a, a low impact product in a bad way with the wrong mm. materials or install it, it's not low impact. So, right. yeah. Yes. Maybe, maybe Ariad, if I could add to that, 
this comes back again to the bamboo. You know, uh, one of the biggest challenges of using natural bamboo poles is the fact that they rot. They're, they're full of sugar. Um, and therefore, in order to, to, to make them sustainable and, and useful for 20, 30 years, means you, you have to treat them. And that means uh, preferably a borax solution, which is environmentally quite safe. There are other ways which are less environmentally, but it does mean, as, as, as Jane says, whatever you do, you have to treat it first. And that's quite a process. Again, in countries where labor is not the biggest issue uh, in, in your, 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 your financial uh, budget, um, that's possible. But, but it, it certainly means extra work, extra efforts, extra energy. And therefore, the question is, again, can you use that bamboo? If you don't treat it, it will rot and presumably deteriorate within five years. Right. And then need either a different sort of schedule of maintenance, repair, or complete replacement as well that then Hopefully, yeah right. has knock on impacts too thank you both very much no a, a, a really good start um and just to say you know any one of these questions could be a session in its own right i see to everybody <laughs> listening so these are questions that will continue to be teased out over the architecture challenge and and we'll get um we'll get some way with discussion today um so a next question um and this one i'm going to put to to rebecca and then to andrew and it is, um, have you observed variation around the world in how natural materials, so continuing with that theme, are viewed and incorporated into building? Um, so for example, just within Advice Network and projects that we've run, that our chapters have run, we've seen that natural materials can be expensive and exclusive in some contexts, um, or stigmatized and associated with poverty or the, or the past in other contexts. Um, so what, what challenge or opportunity or mix of the both um, do you think that that variation in accessibility and acceptance might present? Um, perhaps coming, Rebecca, first to, to you, if you would. Um, that's a brilliant question, Harriet, because um, when I work with bamboo working communities or craft communities, what I have observed is that um, even though they might be producing really high-end products, you know, um, they wouldn't use the products themselves. So I would ask them that, you know, you're making this chair, for example, a bamboo chair, why don't you use it yourself? So they feel aspirationally that um, to move up in the world or to show that they have, uh, you know, arrived in another social status, they need to um, subscribe to industrial products like plastic products and standardized products. And I think it's a question of access and a question of perception. Because when you look at how this entire thing works, you have to create a layer of desirability, you know, and this trickles down because everybody has the internet, you know, every, every uh, person in every village almost has a cell phone with which they can view what the rest of the world is doing. So uh, even in cases where we're doing pro poor products or, you know, um, activities like that, we feel that even though we design an appropriate product, they don't want to accept it because they think it's substandard because it's easily available to them. So therefore it's really important to position these products or these materials first as I would say exclusive uh, products and very much in the mainstream and very much in public view, like in airports and bridges where people can see them and then have this want for them because people are going to, want them only when they see it as an aspirational product and that's something that we're really grappling with and something that i believe is really important mm. aspirational and access no perfectly put rebecca thank you and and andrew um to add to that yes a uh, very a very interesting question i think um there's another aspect to to that if we look at something like timber which um you find in, let's say, in, in Central Africa, you find a lot of people to build a cheaper house. They're importing pine from Canada or somewhere like that. But the tropical, and that pine has to be treated. And in terms of a natural material, it's one step away. There is actually, in all of those countries, very decent termite resistant wood, but that has become, which is a tropical hardwood, but that's become expensive. And so that is exported to the country where they buy the cheap pine from, because it is a desirable thing. So you've got this reverse culture, a bit like Rebecca said, with hardwoods, you know, with wood in particular, 
the the best wood for building is hardwood and it is available but because it is so valuable it's better for them to sell the wood and to buy the cheap pine from Canada. So you've got this, this reverse thing going on. If you go back, uh, if we could talk about vernacular architecture before the export was at such a big scale, it was possible for local people to take a fallen hardwood tree, cut it up and make it into their house, but that no longer happens. Um, so there's, there's this, mm. this other dilemma, which is that the best materials are now worth so much they're being exported and the replacement is a lesser material which is not so natural on the natural scale right so complicated yeah and these and these reversals and i wonder even to take this already difficult question and then sort of to um maybe to to, to take it a bit further and rebecca you alluded to this but i wonder andrew do you can you see something that might be a way um a way to changing that reversal or to or to fixing the, the slightly challenging complex situation of now to put yes. you on the spot <laughs> How yeah, do we no, fix no. It? It, it, it is it is i think that um we have to look at the supply chain um because the value that those people get for that hardwood doesn't necessarily go to them it goes mm. to somebody else somebody else yeah. is taking it so and somehow what we need to be able to do is allow a portion of it to remain in locally available and that would be one way to look at it and often the hardwood comes out in these very big pieces you know which is 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 then milled um, but there are lots of pieces left over that's not worth um, these big mills keeping. So I think it's an interesting thing to look at, is there some product that comes out of the process that could be put back into the local supply chain? Mm -hmm. So that would be a one way to look at it. Um, so that they, they say they get paid for the wood, but also they get some wood back that, that, that is ready to use for building. Yeah. No, uh, if I could point. just add to that, Harriet, I think that, um, Another issue is that in the global north, uh, we look at the issue of ecological sustainability because um, a fair amount of people already have socioeconomic sustainability, right? But you, if you're in a situation where people don't have food to eat, etc., they're obviously going to choose the less sustainable option because they can't afford to choose the more sustainable one. So yeah. I think that um, one great dissonance between the entire subject or discourse of sustainability in the global north and in the global south is that the global north is coming at it from the environmental measurable aspect, but the global south still has to catch up and get its basic needs and those ducks in a row before it can even um, afford to or to participate in that dialogue. You know, so until we look at social, economic, and cultural sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability is unlikely to happen in the global south. Yes, a very good point, and puts more you know, an, an onus and a pressure and responsibility on the global north to do an even better job of what needs to be done in order to help and buy time and keep a balance for, for other parts of the world. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Andrew. I wonder, Hans or, J or Jane, anything you'd add? Um, on this well, question. I, I, yeah, I, I'd like to pick up on, on what, what Rebecca said. I think perception is very important as well. Again, if I think about bamboo, um, Rebecca is quite right. You know, most people say, I don't want to live in a bamboo house. It's like a Fred Flintstone house. It's not modern. And yet, as I said earlier, you go to Bali, where there are the most magnificent, very exclusive buildings at a value that I can't afford. I mean, these, these houses are being sold at several million dollars. So it's the perception of, you know, is bamboo poor man's timber or is bamboo actually a design feature? And I think mm. that, that depends how you look at it, um, but it's, it's, it's therefore a very interesting, maybe a change in, 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 in perception. Um, and as Rebecca says, that has partially to do on, on, I guess, the social economic status of people. If you can afford to build these magnificent structures with bamboo, you accept the fact that it's expensive Yet, if you can only afford the cheapest of the cheapest and you don't treat the bamboo and you just use it as, as, as a very simple building material, then it is seen as, as I say, poor man's timber. Yes. Yeah. 
great points coming out of that and um, and some conclusions as, as well, I think leading towards, thank you. Um, so maybe coming on to a to next question, um, is there a need for more consensus on how to calculate carbon and buildings as footprints? And wondering too how students and practitioners can keep informed of research and best practice. Um, and just before I put that initially, I think to Jane, through the discussion we've had already, and another question that's that's sort of occurring to me is, you know, is there a need for more consensus on how to calculate carbon? Is there a need for more consensus sort of from an international perspective, full stop, or even for less consensus? Because just thinking about the discussion we were having on um, even on that first on that first question of you know, the consistencies of defining a natural building material, is it ever really going to be possible to to have consensus mm. and across the global picture? Um, or is it really going to come down to the practitioner of the building and it just being possible for everyone to be supported in, in knowing the right and best way to do, to, to have really the best environmental sustainable built result. Um, but rather than complicating it with that additional question, Jane, I wonder just to put to you, is there a need for more consensus on how to calculate carbon and buildings as footprints? And then some suggestions of how students or practitioners might keep informed of yeah. research. So um, there are standards, international standards that, that cover this um, and uh, in Europe uh, there's a standard called EN 15978 which is quite a detailed standard to calculate carbon and other impacts over the whole life of the building. So I, I would say start there if you're looking at it. Um, what is then required almost at a national level are kind of defaults um, so that you get some sort of consistency um, and that happens certainly in countries where it's regulated so we're already seeing that in France and the Nordics um, Germany they, they have national methodologies that, that basically tell you what to assume um, for your building so you get consistency. Um, there is um, and I will put some links in the chat there is a, a, the RICS have produced a, a guide to whole life carbon assessment, which gives defaults for the UK, but is also quite helpful if you're in a country which hasn't looked at it. I would say that's a very good place to start. Um, and the other place that I would say is a good place to look is something called Edge Buildings, which the World Bank and the IFC have developed as a way of, of assessing the sustainability of buildings. And a third of that score comes from doing an embodied kind of embodied energy, embodied carbon assessment. Um, so if you want to start there, that's those tools are free. Um, a lot of green building councils have also signed up to One Click Planetary, um, which is a free tool. Um, so I'll put all those links in the chat, um, but have a look at that. In terms of how you can get involved, um, I will also put another link in the chat. Um, but there's an organization, the IEA, the International Energy um, Agency, have a, a group of academics and practitioners that are looking at kind of whole life carbon assessment um, and lots of those academics are publishing so if you want to see the kind of latest in in what's happening um, for, for research that's a really good place to go and look um, and I would also recommend that you you find out what's happening in terms of standards development so in every country, there should be a national standards body that will mirror the activities that happen with international standards development. Um, and, and if you're interested, it's worth applying and asking whether you can get involved. And now we have meetings online and um, it's much, much easier for people um, to get involved rather than uh, you don't have to travel somewhere. You can actually just log in to do it. So um, those are my suggestions, but I'll put all the links in the chat. Good suggestions and starting points. Thanks, Jane. And we'll, we'll pick those up from the chat and even put them on to um, and put them onto the architecture challenge resources section as well, so that anyone consulting that in the future can come to them too. Thank you. Um, and I can see. I wonder, Andrew, something to, to add to that. Yes, I, I think just to go back to what Rebecca was talking about in the same same context. You know, this the idea of uh, carbon footprint and how. We think about that in terms of people who are trying to put food on their table. Um, I think it's worth having asking that difficult question. How relevant is that to those people and how do we make it relevant? Um, 
you know, we're talking about the global north, but in the global south, people are struggling to, to eat um, and get some kind of shelter over their head. So how relevant and how do we apply that to, to that kind of informal housing you went, where so many millions of people are living in slums and shacks in, you know, across the world now can barely exist? Um, how do we apply that? That's a, it's a difficult question to ask, and mm. I think we need to ask that. Yeah, no, how do we apply that? Should we be applying that in all contexts, as you say? I mean, and none of these questions um, being able to be answered, if that's the right verb, even in isolation, that it's so many of them require others to be sorted and solved to help lead on to the next, to the next. No, quite right, Andrew. Thank you. And, and, and Rebecca, um, would you like to add something? Yes, so often, um, you know, when we as designers and architects go into communities, um, we encourage them to practice their traditional craft. And we honestly believe that their traditional craft is sustainable because it's natural. So um, uh, when, when I started working in Vietnam for the first time, I told them that, okay, put all of the bamboo into the lake because we're gonna do this the right way, the natural way that is to leach the starch from the bamboo through running water. So I was very delighted with what I had achieved. And seven days later, the villagers came and told me that, uh, ma'am, the fish are dying. And I was like, what? I mean, why are the fish dying? And then when I analyzed it, I realized that what I was doing for commercial production and commercial, I mean like a tiny bit of commercial production was not the village scale, right? So production to consumption systems, especially traditional ones are developed and exist in a particular context and scale. So when you try to apply these natural philosophies to a world with unprecedented unsustainability and development, the economy of scale and the economy of sustainability just doesn't catch up. So um, at some level, these really huge just the scale of the problems needs industrial solutions where monitoring mechanisms are in place to ensure that innocent and naive people like what I did doesn't happen, you know? So um, I think that uh, just because something is natural that doesn't make it correct or appropriate for something, then the immediate context in which it was perceived because the population has exponentially grown and so has the sustainability problem, you know? So just because something is natural, it doesn't mean it's going to be sustainable. In fact, it can affect so many more ecosystems and biosystems than you ever dreamt was possible. And it will, you know. Right. Those ripple effects. Well, and I wonder, and it's such a good thing to, to raise, Rebecca, wondering what resource and repository we all need just to share these learnings um, with each other, the things that go well and the things that go really badly so that we can you know, learn, as you say, we're all on the internet now, we're connected wherever we are. So being able to have access to, um, to some, yeah, to precisely what, you're, what, what all of you are sharing today. Um, Hans, I wonder before, before the next question, would, would you like to, to add anything on this one? Yes, I guess almost qu a question to Jane and, and, and following up on what, what Andrew said. Um, I wonder, Jane, I mean, I assume in, in, in the, the life cycles uh, analysis and and the carbon footprint transport is included but it's one of the big issues for using bamboo in europe um you know i say that architects large architects firms are now using bamboo mainly for interior design for cladding for flooring but most of the bamboo at the moment still comes from china so you know you're using something that is sustainable and has a very low carbon footprint and in fact an lca of flooring produced in China and used in the Netherlands still showed almost a zero footprint because of the end of life burning instead of coal or gas or, or oil. But if you could take away that, that, that transport from the other side of the world to Europe, of course you would reduce the footprint considerably. It's one of the reasons why we're starting to plant bamboo in Europe and see if we can actually generate a source. So that, that's, that's one aspect, and I don't know if that is included in these discussions about carbon footprint of buildings. I assume it is. Yes, so transport is included, but right. if you like, the, the good thing is that transporting goods by, by sea in kind of bulk um, shipping, container shipping, is actually one of the most efficient ways of transporting materials. Okay. So it's not 
it's not as significant or it's not as significant an, Im an impact as, as you might imagine and it it if it is significant for bamboo it's generally because as a product it's a very low impact product yeah. um True. so i i it, it's accounted for i mean i think one of the concerns i i with growing bamboo in europe is is the rainfall and the, the water that you might need for it so in in areas where it's commonly grown you have a lot of rainfall you know it's it's whether that's as simple in the you know in, in europe to actually have that availability of water to, to it, grow it. it it depends on the species jane i mean there are yeah. more than 1600 different species and there are species that grow in basically drought conditions ethiopia has a natural bamboo that's that Brilliant. grows very well at 400 millimeters a year so it, it depends on the species but i think the, the other issue you know what, what andrew said i think the the fact that that there are other sustainability aspects that may be more important for people one of the reasons that that bamboo is used extensively in ecuador and in colombia is because it's it's earthquake proof and it's one of the things that we found sadly during an earthquake um, you know, the last one in Ecuador, just a few years ago, most of the concrete buildings that had been constructed collapsed and the bamboo structures, whether they either were the traditional Baharak uh, methodology or, you know, a little bit more modern, mainly tourist um, facilities, they survived, they, they trembled, they, they wobbled, but they didn't fall down. And as a result, the government has now changed its building um, laws, its building criteria so that you can actually reconstruct with bamboo and you can get a subsidy because that was part of the problem people said okay i want to rebuild my house can i use bamboo and at the time it was impossible to get a government uh, allowance that is now possible but it's only ecuador colombia and peru that have made that change in most other countries bamboo is not included in the building code and therefore if you want to use it you have to do a lot of testing and, and you have to basically prove that it is safe mm -hmm. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Jane. And um, yes, we had we had on the first session um, of these webinars, Yasmin Lari from Pakistan, who I think showed a video on that mm. session, a wonderful sh yeah. table shape test that she did with a, a bamboo and earth building in, in Pakistan. So if that could be shown internationally, you know, as a piece of evidence, as proof that in fact, you know, this is a good material. And another good point, Hans, is, is construction standards and those and the variety of those and needing to reinvent the wheel in uh, every different one of those systems of standards around the world. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Hans. Um, Rebecca, um, to, to, to you, something to add. Um, I also wanted to ask a question, uh, Jane. I mean, how many of these uh, building standards, because I, I also work a bit with certifications, but not really uh, building certifications. And I find that most of the certifications or standards look only at the environmental aspect. So they don't record the social and economic unsustainability that they're causing, you know? So if you have standards that only measure some part of it, some part of the whole, I mean, are we even sure that when we, because sustainability is so much in flux and about making difficult choices and trade-offs. I mean, do we have a way to measure all of these complexities? And if we don't, does this even really make sense? Or should we just trust our gut and, you know, hope for the best? I mean, is there some sanity in this madness? Um, I, I would be concerned about people trusting their guts because it doesn't really always pay off. Um, there are lots of solutions that you think might be good that aren't necessarily. So I think it is already really relevant to try and measure um, you're right, there is, well, for economics, at least in terms of quantifying the cost and the whole life cost of buildings, there are kind of standards for doing that and, and they're quite well developed. Um, but certainly in terms of, of trying to quantify uh, kind of social and, and the kind of wider economic benefits, that's, that's really hard to do. So there are standards that are being written, um, but it takes longer and you certainly don't really get a number um, so that that's a kind of problem. I mean, just looking at the environmental impacts. I mean, we actually, when we assess a building using those standards, we 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 measure twenty seven indicators. Um, but to be honest, carbon is is kind of like the one number that a lot of people use because it, it, there's so many numbers and and it, 
kind of carbon is is the pressing issue so i would say i i think you should look at carbon and and measure that it's, it's easier to just measure one indicator at least then you know whether you're producing a building that's that's kind of climate friendly um and and it'd be great to look at all the other indicators and try and assess social and, and economic sustainability as well but i think if you've got limited time and limited money then maybe carbon is is as good as you can do Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, bringing us on to the next question. Um, according to UN Habitat and World Bank figures, by 2030, up to 3 billion people will need new housing and basic infrastructure. So are the best, greenest, most sustainable, based on indigenous, indigenous traditional, local and vernacular design solutions undermined sort of um, uh, automatically if they cannot be deployed at scale? Um, so I wonder, I, this I think relevant to, to any one of you, um, so any takers who'd like to start us off on that question. Andrew. Yes, uh, yeah, this is a challenge that is coming, like it is a, a huge train that's hitting every, every city in the global south. Um, and often those people that need the housing are moving into marginal areas. And this is that is most affected by climate change, so that they are the most vulnerable to any change in the climate, um, to big storms. Often those cities are near the sea, to flooding, storms, and so it, it is very difficult. And I, you know, I, I think we've all seen um, the sort of global north architectural solutions for low income housing, and that's impossible to scale up at the scale that is needed and at the speed that is needing. So um, something that we've been working with uh, the Princess Foundation actually is to try and think about this at a different level and realize that the, the real experts at surviving and adapting their houses in, in that level of housing, in formal housing, in shacks, in um, whatever we want to call it, um, are actually the people who live there because we don't know what it's like to live in a slum. We, and we can't come up with a solution to live there when you've got literally no money and your materials are, is the rubbish around you. So, but what we did realize is there are experts living and building in those communities already. And so it is more of a challenge of getting the information from those experts and spreading it around within that community. So it's a, a very grassroots, I don't really like that phrase, but that's, that's where that has to come from that as well as from other places. But um, mm. to recognize that a lot of those, those people are coming from rural areas with their own traditional vernacular buildings that have been adapted already and they have that knowledge which is going to be lost you know, within a generation because they're no longer building like that. And I think it's, it's really critical that we, we gather that information and rebrand it, if you like, so that everybody can use it and get the best of the best. And you can walk around, you know, the slums in Nairobi, for example, and you see people coming up with these amazing solutions with absolutely nothing. Um, and it's, it's, there's, we tend to ignore them because they're not experts, but actually they are the real experts, the people that are living there and who are surviving those conditions. And you see them walking out their front door in the morning, perfectly dressed, going to an office and living in a, in a slum. So I think there's a lot to be learned for that. And I think we need to put more value and more emphasis on getting that information spread out. So another reason that, yes, this connectivity, internet, et cetera, digital age being able to be used uh -huh. for the good and the at scale element, maybe trusting that to come more from the level at which it's really being lived um, and where that expertise is sitting already. Yeah, really good points. Thanks, Andrew. Coming to Rebecca next. So um, since we work a lot with materials that are traditionally craft materials, um, uh, we do realize every day that 
our only point of reference for say structural strength or structural adequacy is actually the community, right? So I, I will often ask a craftsman I'm working with that how many poles do I need or is this going to stand or is this going to bear the weight? Because there are no kind of standards or engineering um, anything that you can go to for materials that are non-mainstream or craft materials, you know. So often um, in the mainstream, even if you wanted to construct, say, a bamboo house or a mud house, um, given that there are so many species of bamboo and every age of bamboo uh, is a differently behaved bamboo, you know, unless you can find a way to kind of capture that knowledge, as Andrew was saying, you know, and make it available to other people who might want to, in collaboration with the community or separately, try to develop experiments and explorations. There is no real way to do it. So the closest you have to a structural engineer is actually the barefoot engineer community person, you know. So um, there need to be alternative kind of knowledge systems which are accepted into building explorations. And these definitely need to be documented and repository and accessible to, you know, everybody else. Yeah, no, good points there too. And not just relying on the fact that in contexts where there maybe isn't a planning system or, you know, safety approval that's required is sometimes where some of the best, most naturally sustainable, zero carbon, safe and resilient houses can be built because those checks aren't happening. But in a lot of cases, not having those checks isn't necessarily a good thing um, because the wrong things can be can be built as well that, that don't necessarily help people or, or planet. But thanks, thanks, Rebecca. I wonder, Hans, would you like to add anything? Please? Yes, I, in fact, I, I, I want to raise something completely different, Harriet. I think one of the other problems <laughs> is that cement is too cheap. Yeah. I mean, basically cement, you know, I think the, 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 the figures are that the cement industry contributes something like 7% of the CO2 emissions in the world. Yeah. And cement is simply not taxed from an environmental perspective. So if, if governments would be serious and withdraw the subsidies and actually put an environmental tax on making cement out of limestone, all of a sudden, a lot of these other building traditional building methods would become much more realistic. Because mm -hmm. I think that's still the problem that even people that haven't really got the finance go for cement because it is easy, cheap, and, and they think it's strong. And as mm -hmm. I said earlier, in earthquakes, we know it's not. Uh, typhoons in Philippines also have shown that it doesn't really stand up to a typhoon. So it, it's really getting people off that, that, that mm -hmm. notion that cement is the is the building material of the future because it should be the building material of the past and that's all to do with regulations and government uh, thinking and i hope this is something that would actually come out of cop 26 because i think that's the kind of decision we need to have from governments to say you know let's get serious yes very clear very good point and ending the fact that we equate you know, something like cement with being able to build at scale and sort of the mass produced building material that that yep, needing to change and through subsidies through government action very good. I wonder, Jane, that you might like to, to follow on from that. Just the only thing I would add is, is we have kind of problems, for example, using re reused materials in the mm. UK. So there's a, a big kind of emphasis in trying to increase the reuse of materials. But again, it's, it's caused problems with certification and, and quality and people being, you know, having that risk of, of using material that's already come out of a building. You know, what can it do? Um, so I think that, that there are issues there that, that are interesting. That's so interesting, yeah, especially in a context where the, the Royal Institute of British Architects in the UK have quite recently said wanting to see no new building, you know, just reuse of everything that's already existing in a country like the UK. Obviously, there's huge demand and need for new building in, in other yeah. parts of the world. Um, we'd be coming to a, to a sub question, to the one we were just talking about. Uh, and we've touched on some of the themes that are in this um, already, but what should our tolerance be or what should tolerance be for combining low and no carbon materials and construction techniques, you know, where we feel confident and sure that those are assessed as being low and no carbon materials and construction techniques with carbon intensive materials and construction techniques, at least in the near term. Um, so some of this question of maybe some of the global divides between where need is for new building, where accessibility and desirability of materials are, um, affordability obviously being a huge question as well. So 
what kind of tolerance should we all know, should be having, depending on where we are in the world, for combining those low carbons with the more carbon intensives for now? Um, I wonder, Jane, would you attempt to start? I saw you on mute and I'm gonna, I could have seized the chance to push that one on you. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think you, you have to have a place potentially for some unsustainable materials so um you know we we haven't really come up with with much better ways of producing foundations than using concrete um you know things like preserving timber you need kind of things that are, are unsustainable or less sustainable to, to actually achieve that so I, I think you can't be um kind of really extreme i think you have to have some tolerance but um yeah I, I think you just have to do as much as you can to try and increase the amount of no and zero car uh, low carbon materials you do to, to reduce the impact of your building as far as you can right maybe hoping that's a process that naturally builds and builds as more research is done and it becomes possible to add more and more yep andrew and to you yes if i if i could just be very practical i, I agree with with what Jane was saying. I think what we've found, because a lot of our buildings are in, you know, in the tropics where it is an extreme environment for a building and often it's not maintained. So we put uh, the higher carbon materials in the most, where the most durable material is needed and where the least amount of maintenance happens. So just something as simple as, you know, a very low wall that goes onto the floor so the wood isn't sitting on the floor and it doesn't rot is a simple solution that seems to work and we know that people tend to wash the floor with a lot of water um, <laughs> and it always rots the bottom of the walls this is a very simple practical thing so we you know put a block wall with with a bit of concrete down there and that gets you the first six inches off the ground and off off there and then you can go into a natural material and it makes everything last longer so i think you know that that seems like a compromise that we should be able to accept mm. good practical example was a yeah good case study there as well thanks andrew wonder rebecca maybe and then hans if you want to add or hans and then rebecca as you like um, <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it this is like an idealistic question because it's saying that what should your sample size be and the answer is 100%, but of course you can never achieve the 100% in any sample size, right? So you go for the next best. But um, I think it might be helpful to, uh, you know, uh, tighten the bolts slowly and to have a process um, to have mini goals, which you work towards and say that this is, this is the minimum ratio or uh, better still, this is the maximum ratio that we're going to accept and let people figure it out. So mm -hmm. I think that um, as long as we're just discussing this with no policy intervention, it's it's all blue sky and it's like nothing is basically nothing that you construct is sustainable, right? It can just be less unsustainable. So realizing that, I mean, unless policy comes into the picture and unless you have some rules, whether they are good bad lacks or whatever you know for what you basically need to do i i don't think that uh, there can be a number and i don't think that there can be a number which is global you know because we are discussing such different scenarios so it should be that this is the ideal and how are the how how is everyone going to work toward it and at what pace and at what you know what what point are we going to equalize it i, I don't think there can be a universal answer for this yeah, no, a really good point. And the reason why we've named this the architecture challenge, just thinking about the participants coming up with their design solutions in the competition part that, you know, these webinars and the materials we'll put on the website will, will, will hopefully help and be a good grounding of knowledge. But so much of it is going to be up to those participants looking at the context for which they're designing, really to need to, to find the specific answers, potential solutions, tested solutions for, for those for those areas with all sorts of factors that vary depending on where you are in the world taken into consideration. Thanks Rebecca and, and, and Hans, to coming to you. Yes, thanks Harriet. I think, you know, as, as Jane says, um, there are certain things that are very difficult to change. I know from some of the bamboo constructions around pole constructions that I mentioned earlier, the foundation is still 
concrete because putting your bamboo poles in the soil basically means it's the end of your bamboo pole. So you do have to have some kind of, of, of a barrier, as it were, between the, the, the sustainable construction material and the soil. And, and concrete is, is at the moment the, the most obvious way of doing it. I think on the other side, if you go back to, to, to the sort of European, the Western use of, of engineered bamboo, um, I think the problem there is that there are no accepted guidelines, as far as I know, to use bamboo for, for load-bearing structural development. So here in Europe, bamboo is very much used for interior design, and you can get green points or, or lead points for it. So it's cladding, it's, it's flooring, it's paneling, it's, it's ceiling, um, all of that within quite possibly a structure that is actually high carbon. So I think in, the, in that case, you can, you can minimize the impact. You can, you can as I say, get your extra sustainability points by using the interior from a very sustainable mm -hmm. product. But for the moment, I guess we have to accept that you can't all of a sudden change the whole world and say, we will no longer use concrete. Right, yes, yeah. No, very in yeah, interesting and good point. And I wonder, Hans, maybe to you and to Andrew, with that example of bamboo and not meeting the ground and needing those six inches or a bit more, a bit less um, at the base of the wall. What is, you know, if, if government subsidies ended for concrete for cement and if it wasn't affordable, wasn't the material mm. anymore, what, what could be used instead, do you think, for this bit? What would you well, suggest? I, I could show you some photos uh, of, of, of some of the construction in Bali where they basically use stones from the river, round stones. Mm -hmm which you put underneath your pole. The thing is that you then have to bevel your pole. You have to do a bit of, of, of scraping to make sure that it fits perfectly. Right. But that's one way of actually creating that barrier. Yeah, and those more natural materials, good reminders to all of us that we need to deal with imperfection in life and in building. Yeah, and Andrew, what, what, what thoughts? So I think, I think that um, what we can consider is using cement as a much lesser component in the mixture. I mean, we, you can mix cement at a 5% mixture and make a very strong mixture, um, which actually works. So not necessarily getting rid of cement altogether, but using it in different ways um, with a slightly different mixture. You know, if you mix cement and clay, you, you end up with quite an interesting uh, material. So there are other ways to think about it as well. If it is more expensive, you use less of it. And I think we, we all go, seem to go for the same PSI concrete, basically. You know, we, we just use those PSI standards and we all think we're just going to use that. Whereas actually there's, there is another way to think about it and we tend to ignore it. Mm. So I think that, that, that's a, a different way to think about um, cement. But there are natural materials like clay, um, which is a great, Thing, you dig out the ground, you heat it up, and it becomes this other thing. Yeah, good answers. Thank you. Um, I think also, Harriet, maybe just to, to, to add to that, what Jane said earlier about recycling. I know when, when I was still with IUCN, we had a lot of discussion about recycling cement and basically using you know, rubble from, from old construction and somehow integrate that with new cement. And I understand that that is quite possible. You know, Hans, when we had the earthquake in India, exactly that is what happened because people were searching for the cheapest building material and then they found that the rubble was the cheapest building material. So it wasn't from the perspective of sustainability, but just what is easily accessible. And it was perfect. And, you know, they re rebuilt villages and villages using rubble. Yeah. Yeah. I think, that, sorry, go ahead, Jane. <laughs> just one of, one of the really... Um, nice innovations which I kind of really cross my fingers is going to, to come off in the Netherlands they've been looking when they, when you crush concrete to, to reuse the aggregate the actual the kind of dust which is the original cement that was kind of between the, the stones that they're now taking that and processing that to remake cement from it because it's kind of already nearly there um, so that there's some really positive kind of ways of, of trying to, to to um, reduce the impact of, of kind of cement in the future. I, I think that uh, I, I agree, I agree with that, but I think maybe what we should be doing is looking at a new building and the life cycling of the materials in that new building and how they could be recycled. And I think 
concrete is in particular, if you've ever tried to use concrete, it's a pain in the neck because it's full of rebar. Um, and I think particularly in some circumstances in the tropic, we don't need as much rebar as we think we need. Um, I'm getting into complicated engineering here, but pulling it out is very difficult and very difficult to crush because you've got to, you've then got all these bits of metal sticking everywhere. It's dangerous to move. It's, it's just, it's very hard. And I think we should be thinking about materials when we put them into building of the life cycle and then the reuse at the end. So I think, I think that, you know, we can even think as we start a building, what happens, you know, when you do an environmental impact study, you have to write down what happens if this project fails and you have to clean it out. I think we should look at every building like that. What happens when we knock it down? And, and that is part of an, a kind of life cycle assessment or carbon footprint study. If right. You do the standards, follow the standards. So, yeah. And Andrew, one of the interesting things in Singapore is doing research to see if you can use bamboo as rebar. And their I've research... tried it. So <laughs> I've, tried, I've tried it in a very thin um, concrete roof, just uh -huh. using rebar. And it's actually worked very well. Yeah. We did it as a kind of mat. So we, we split it and then we weaved it together and put it in the middle of the concrete. And as long as you don't let it stick out anywhere, because mm. then it, it rots. Yes. Um, yes. So far, it's holding up. So it won't I'll, rust I'll, for sure. I'll, te I'll tell you in ten years whether it's still <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we 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 we're experimenting, and the thing is, you can get a very thin um, mm -hmm. structural layer. True. Uh, yeah, I'd love to look at rebar more because it's something that we just use. You, we just use, you know, same mixture of concrete with rebar. We just and we've been doing that for uh, I don't know how long now we should re-look at those, the properties of all the materials. I've tried fiberglass too. That didn't work so well. Mm. And that's not a natural material, so I prefer the bamboo. <laughs> thing. More learnings, Andrew, that need to, be, need to be shared and accessible globally, to figure out the things that have been tried and, and, and what works. Um, I wonder too, and I know Rebecca, you, you've certainly spent time in the Netherlands, um, and there's a, there's a, I think an architect, I'm not sure if he is an architect, but there's somebody uh, who has put together a database, I think called Madaster, that has catalogued sort of many, many thousands of square feet worth of building materials that, that are in existing building stock now, with the view that a building that has, for example, you know, 18 windows of a certain size, that building is coming down, making those reusably available to other building projects so that we've got this sort of upcycling. I mean, we're already getting used to doing upcycling and sharing in other ways. So why not with building materials that continue to be usable, safe, and have a lot of life left in them? So finding the ways to account for that at the beginning to calculate what that means environmentally, um, et cetera. But yeah, more such databases around the world would be very good. Uh, and I can see that someone has very helpfully, uh, in fact, the chair of Inbound Netherlands has just very helpfully shared uh, a link on the, on the chat that might come through to something more about that. Uh, so coming through to what, one last question that I'm going to ask before moving to, to Q&A from, from you, the participants. So do keep thinking of your questions and get them typed into the Q&A box. Um, but a, 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 a last question to everyone, uh, which is, um, is it possible to reconcile today's climate responsive design with today and tomorrow's climate change? So, for example, that the materials and forms of design available and known now might not be suited to the climate and conditions in 20 to 30 years time. So in effect, quite a depressing question of, are we ever really going to catch up and be able to get ahead of all of this? And perhaps some thoughts and ideas on um, how we might do that, whether that really is a problem we need to be thinking about in the context of all the others that we've been looking at. Um, who would perhaps like to start on this one? Andrew, it's to you. Yeah, so I actually started thinking about this because of um, we were looking at agriculture and what grew, what grows now in marginal areas in in Africa, for example, and realizing that what was growing wasn't going to be working if the climate continued to change as it is. And then, of course, we had to look at the houses that people were living in which had evolved over hundreds of years and 
now those houses are no longer able to withstand you know the big rain events for example that i think a big rain event is is something that will destroy the traditional house the the storm event that happened once every hundred years is now happening every five years in some areas and so we've almost got to move the architecture the vernacular arch architecture from a different region down and how do you even begin to think about that? You know, it's, it's something, and how do we think about the climate that's going to happen? Or do we think about buildings that are super adaptable so that um, we can adapt them as the climate change? Mm. It's a, di I mean, it's a very difficult question, which is what we're trying, we're here for, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right on topic, uh, but great thoughts on that. And Jane, would you like to come in? Yeah. No, I I just think we need to be careful that we're not kind of cutting off um, answers because we know it's it's harder to get standards and to, to know exactly how to use some of these more traditional or kind of vernacular materials. Um, if you're then saying we need this building to be 20% or 50% stronger, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, it's making sure you're still able to do that without somebody going, oh, well, we'll have to use cement because that's the only way yeah. we can tick that box um yeah. so but I, I think yeah you absolutely 100 percent need to be thinking about what you are going to be facing in in 30 years um and, and kind of trying to design for that as far as you can yeah no a good point doing the best in the moment that can be done with what's available with an eye on the longer term as much as that's yeah kind of possible and being being resilient being adaptable with what you design into good ways to try and do that Hans, Undo, would you like to add? Yes, thank you, Harriet. I, I mean, I, I'm looking at it as a slightly bigger perspective almost, if that's the right word, looking at it from an urban development design. I think, you know, with, with coastal warming and sea level rise, which um, we know is going to happen, we don't know how much. Again, bearing in mind that, that I can't remember the actual statistic, but it's something like 40% of the large metropolises actually are located in coastal areas they will have to rethink now what that means for building materials i'm not sure but you will have to think about houses on stilts basically buildings that allow the fact that you might be having wet feet for weeks on end um because during whatever typhoon system uh, period or the monsoon rains or whatever you actually are in a city that is no longer dry so this, this, the concept that the Chinese are working on, which they call sponge cities, which is basically bringing back a lot of the natural drainage um, that may have been there and that's basically been covered up with, with concrete and, and, and asphalt. Um, and, and I say, looking at how you could raise some of the buildings so that water can actually flow underneath. Now that's not so much looking at the materials, but I guess it is looking at how you construct um, and indirectly that would then I guess get you into questions about what kind of materials is is most suitable um, and certainly the rebars would be a problem because they rust so you'd have to think about yes how would you reinforce your concrete if it is concrete or other other ways that you could build particularly the foundations I guess mm, yeah oh interesting thank you Hans and Rebecca would you like to add um, yeah so I think that um the climate isn't changing we are changing the climate right and um, it's for several several <laughs> anthropocentric reasons like for example um, i was just talking to someone who had a resort and he said and he's, he's in the desert and he said that guess what a python turned up in our water supply and i was like a python in the desert and so it turns out that the rivers have been re-networked to give everybody access to water and so the python fell into the water and uh, there was this entire discussion we had as uh, practitioners and academics um, as to how we are actually changing bioregions, right, by doing this stuff. We're greening things, we're changing things. So climate change is not happening only because of building stuff, you know, it's also happening because of all of these anthropocentric development activities. So at some point, um, unless we look at this at a system level, and not just as, you know, each discipline addressing a tiny bit of it. I mean, the problem is that nobody's talking to each other. And there are these pockets of information everywhere. And unless 
we network them because i mean eventually we're all connected and the butterfly effect is going to get us some way or the other you know so <laughs> unless we we form networks of information which is so possible now with these decentralized kind of information system and flow kind of mechanisms like what we're doing here i i, I don't think that i mean i don't think that we need to think of um, something as inevitable and beyond our control because we are really the orchestrators of everything that is happening right so the agency on people who are making these decisions whether they are designers architects and politicians this agency needs to be this onus needs to be on people right to see the conclusions and the impacts of the decisions true and take ownership for it i mean otherwise we're all just living in agenda 21 right where everybody commits that we're going to do something good but nobody actually does it so very good point no and the reminder that yet nothing in isolation and the different pieces of puzzle connecting together you know we know the built environment has a great responsibility it's it's responsible directly and indirectly for a lot of carbon emissions but just fixing that can't happen on its own and then that's not the solution in and of itself yep quite right um thanks all of you and any 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 and anything else to add to that last question before we take a couple from the audience or shall we shall we move to those um well the first one that's come from pit actually is for me to answer which is maybe fair <laughs> gives all four of you a break whilst i answer this one um so pit is is uh, planning to participate in the architecture challenge with ma students i guess on a on a program that he's teaching and is wondering if there's a more detailed comprehensive document sort of with all the 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 information about the competition and how to take part and the answer is pit that there will be uh, at the point at which the design phase and the design competition phase launches in november so all of that will come and then the competition will be open for submissions for a six month period from november so when everything comes up online and available we'll make a big announcement um and there will also then be a very good length of of time a good window in which to to work to those designs and refer back to sessions like this one to get additional thoughts and and ideas and to work into designs so thanks for that question that's a good thing to point out um coming to one now from Fiona uh who's wondering about uh the use of of hemp maybe as a as another material that is one we didn't didn't refer to in in discussions sort of up till now um and Fiona one thing i would point out is that we had a a really good session last summer that's on the inba website uh, about hempcrete with someone from UK hempcrete so that an interesting thing and he uh speaking sort of in a global context of where it's possible to use it to to grow it and then to use it as a building material and where it's not um so i wonder uh, would any would anyone jane or hans i can see you're unmuted would either of you like to come in on hans no jane anything on on yes yeah well I, i mean i was just going to mention hempcrete that's the only um example that i i've seen but um it, it's obviously it's a crop i think a little bit like bamboo that it if it grows if it's happy somewhere <laughs> it it just grows very easily without needing fertilizers and and pesticides so it's it's from that point of view a reasonably sustainable crop um so yeah and and certainly within hemcrete that's that's quite a a good product um but i'm i'm sure you certainly can use the hemp fiber um i know it goes into banknotes and fabrics and things like that so um yeah i i'm sure there are ways that it can be used but um Good. Great. No, thanks Jane. And Fiona, and I hope that hope that helps. Um you'll be coming to a question that actually links back to the previous session in this series which was about vernacular traditional local and indigenous tradition of what what that what that means and sort of where in the world. Um and we mentioned at that point but didn't really get into it just the slight irony and tension that's created by the fact that this the architecture challenge is an initiative for for architects and architecture students you know amongst others and that vernacular architecture really you know something that 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 can be that sh- that should that has been considered an architecture without architects um so how is it maybe some some thoughts reflections from from all of you sort of working within that space and especially those you know as architects yourselves sort of thinking about your own training your practice thus far does it feel like it's a lot of learning and so forth to evolving just to to be qualified to do something that previously just used to to happen <laughs> um i wonder andrew if that's what oh and J- jane perhaps we start with you and then come to andrew well I, i'm just going to say when i 
I did a master's um, in environmental architecture and we, we spent weeks looking at how Venetians use their blinds and how um, in Yemen they have the, the wind towers. And, you know, it, 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 it was fascinating and brilliant and I loved it. And then I just sat there and thought, well, I can't imagine that the way that we live in our houses where I am in the UK doesn't come from that sort of background. Um, mm. So I looked at net curtains, which, you know, everybody hates but um they have a u value just a little bit higher than than double glazing so if you've got single glazing and you put in a, a net curtain you get a uh, thermal comfort the temperature of them is much higher than the cold glass if you're in a cold climate um so that th they have loads of benefits they also throw light into the back of the room and reduce Blair. So I, I'm just going to say that I think we often look at the indigenous or the, the kind of vernacular for where we live and think that it's not beneficial and, and that people do things much better in other countries. And, and so mm. I just have a kind of cry to look at what your actual national vernacular is and, and really appreciate how it might um, help. Yeah, no, good point. Absolutely. And that vernaculars are, sh are shifting always too, you know, as climates are shifting, as availability of materials and so on. So there's lots to learn from our own and elsewhere. No, good, really good point, Jane. Thank you. Um, Andrew and then, and then Rebecca. Yeah, so I, I think that um, especially with, particularly with climate change, the vernacular of, um, let's say the global south, which is generally hotter than the global north, the global north is getting hotter. That architecture has evolved because of that temperature often um, in and I'm talking about Africa in particular and I know that um, going to visit my sister in her cottage which is 700 years old in Dorset in the summer was unbearable because it was too hot and I made some suggestions that she could make some changes to her cottage without ruining the beautiful cottage and the suggestions came from vernacular architecture in Africa. And so I feel like, yes, it, it's something that is, can be shared and it has value. Um, it's, it's again, it's, it's an information thing. You know, there are some basic rules that have evolved. I mean, there's a simple thing in, uh, let's say a top hung window. When it rains, you can still have your window open because the rain doesn't come in. That's, that's a really simple example of uh, if you look at um, a vernacular house in Central Africa, they're all, they, they don't have glass in their windows. They have these openings, but they're all top hung because they can open it during a rainstorm. And, you know, there's stuff like that that we could think about um, and translate into contemporary architecture. Mm. Yeah, and, and crucially, Andrew, will your, will your sister make those changes? Will she take your advice? Oh, she did it, yeah. She did. Very good. Excellent. Good points. Um, Rebecca, we come to you. Um, yeah, so just drawing on what Jane said and also on what Andrew said, I mean, I think that the vernacular has never been um, one kind of frozen slide in time, right? Because everything is evolving. Um, if we looked at what is truly vernacular, would it be the caveman in his cave or you know, so as cultures met and developed and talked to each other, vernaculars evolved as well. So I think looking at this as some sacrosanct rule book, Bible sort of thing, which everyone needs to follow, um, doesn't make sense. I mean, if we look at the vernacular of different places as bodies of knowledge uh, in, you know, produced in context of a space or a bioregion or a situation, and we deconstructed them into building blocks that could be applied into other situations that would create a global vernacular or a vernacular of the global, globally unsustainable world that we're looking at. So I think that it's rather romantic uh, for craft practitioners to stick to this idea of heritage and vernacular, except if you're really looking at conservation kind of aspects. But otherwise, I think that today's present is going to be tomorrow's vernacular, right? So we need to see this as a body of knowledge in flux rather than like a vignette of, you know, certain frames in time. Yeah, very well put. Thank you, Rebecca. And Hans, I wonder, would you like to add anything on this question? I'm not an architect, so maybe I'm no. just looking at it from the outside. That's okay. It's interesting <laughs> what, what you're talking about. I'm thinking, you know, maybe one of the vernacular 
ways of building in the Netherlands was thatched roofs. Um, and, and certainly coming back to the whole issue of climate change, is that going to be realistic in 20, 30 years time? Maybe we simply don't have that availability anymore. So does, does a sort of traditional, whether it's vernacular, I'm not, I'm not sure, way of building change with climate change because simply the, the, the raw materials are no longer available or are becoming too expensive um, or other materials become available. Hmm. Yeah, no, a good thought there. And yeah, I think I, I'm and looking at the at the Q and A and just thinking, I think all of all four of you have done such a good job of answering the questions we've been through that um, that we've got an audience of participants who are who are very hesitant to ask any questions of their own because they're enjoying the answers that have been given to these questions, um, which is great. But this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pose one more and that will give it a little bit of time if anyone has a, a last pressing question that they want to put in to the Q&A box, then please do. Um, but what I'd like to ask just before we finish is having been listening to a lot of the BBC radio programme in our time lately, uh, they do a very good thing at the end that gives everyone the chance if there was something that they didn't get to say or that they wish had been brought up but wasn't during the, the programme, uh, the chance at the end to, to say it or to bring it up um, so I wonder, coming to each of you in turn, was there anything, maybe starting Rebecca with you, any, anything that, that didn't come up either in an answer or a question that, um, that you wish we'd asked or something you wish we'd talked more about? Um, nothing really. I think we did pretty well, Harry. <laughs> but I would generally say that for me personally, these ideas of natural or carbon I, I don't believe they can work in isolation because um, like they say, if you torture data enough, it'll say whatever you want it to. Yeah. So I think that while there's a science to it, there's also a poetry to it, right? There's also a conscience to it. There's also an agency to it. So, I mean, it is so much easier to go through a rule book and tick the boxes. And I also think it's necessary to know the rules and tick the boxes. But at some point, I think that everyone needs to reflect on what the trade-offs are that they are making because there are going to be trade-offs, right? Because not everything that counts can be counted. So, I mean, I think that this kind of more holistic perspective of not labeling it natural or carbon, but looking at the sustainability issue on, on a systems level is, I think, the, the way forward to a solution. Excellent takeaway point. Thank you, Rebecca, very much. Um, perhaps, Jane, could we come to you to you next? Yeah, I think the only thing I would say is if, you, if you're trying to reduce the embodied carbon of your building, materials is just one bit of it, the choice of materials, the actual form of your building. Um, there's been some interesting work on kind of form factor and, and kind of really efficient design um, really helps, um, helps there. And sort of going back to that vernacular for the UK, the terraced house is is the best way in terms of embodied carbon. It gives you the most yeah. building for the least amount of impact. You know, the bungalow is the worst. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah. And the other thing is just kind of material efficiency. Um, you know, just try to use as little material as, as you need to do a job. Yeah, yeah. very good points. Um, hands perhaps to you next and and then to Andrew anything you'd want to add thanks Harriet it's just one of the issues that that was a big discussion when 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 I was in China is how and, and we dealt with it a little bit but it's the scale you know how can you actually bring and I'm again thinking of construction with bamboo to a scale where it would be used for let's say social housing and and the two the two sort of issues that came up was one prefab housing you know can you use bamboo as a as as, as prefab panels um and the issue there is simply a supply, a supply question you know can you can you supply enough bamboo to create an industry that could make the prefab panels and then construct the panels on site to build particularly disaster housing and that's the other thing um which is an interesting aspect for example i know that that the, the refugee camps in Bangladesh have most of their um, administrative buildings made from bamboo. Um, you know, and, and it was it was 
There's a lot of bamboo in Bangladesh. It was a cheap way, it was an easy way. And there are local engineers that know how to work with bamboo. So in order to provide quick infrastructure, as it were, in this enormous refugee camp, bamboo was an option. But if it's been done piecemeal individually, it's expensive. It could only be done because there was support from IOM and the UN. The only way that you could really make this happen, I think, on a mass scale, as I say, looking at how you could use a building material that is in itself sustainable, but in a way that you could have prefab panels that you could then erect without too much extra work. Hmm. Excellent points on scale. No, thank you, Hans, very much. And, and Andrew, coming to you. So I think uh, a question that I think maybe would be an interesting one to ask and answer is, so if, if the people who are doing competition, where do they find really good examples of local vernacular architecture, what techniques for keeping build buildings that respond to the climate they're in? And I, I found that the best examples are usually the local schools. You go to a local school, um, you look at it, it, it's done on a limited budget. Often there's no electricity in the school. Um, there are lots of willing participants who will tell you, if you ask them, uh, what the building is like, which bits are hot and which bits aren't. Um, and they will use as many techniques to make that building comfortable as possible, regardless of form. Um, it's often built purely on function um, at very low maintenance using materials and skills that are available. So looking at rural schools is to me a great resource of looking at local styles and usually those schools have, not always, have evolved out of the local vernacular. Um, so, and I've, I've, I've collected hundreds, I've, actually I've built several schools and just simply gone around the local schools and used what they've done. Um, mm. You know, we used to say our, our temperature gauge was the dog because the dog always finds the coolest part of the house and you know, when it's hot. Well, children are kind of the same. You can just watch them stand in the playground and they'll, you'll soon find out which classrooms the teachers don't want to use because uh, they're too hot and then you can work out why they're too hot and I, I you know I'm talk I, I work in the uh, humid hot climate mostly but it applies to cold climates too uh, where's the warmest place so yeah. I think that's that's you know if you want to know where to find good vernacular architecture that's just practical response architecture go and look at the schools go look at the schools e excellent point and a really good piece of advice as well to anyone looking to take part in the in the competition that look at the schools locally and look online at schools elsewhere think about those a great idea thanks andrew um well with that then it, it's really it's to me to, to thank all four speakers so to thank hans and jane rebecca and andrew very very much for for being with us this afternoon and for answering all these questions and discussing and asking more questions as well um, thanks to, to, to um, Juliet Butler, our program manager, and to Janos Polykorniadis for doing all they did to make this session actually possible and to make it work. Um, to everyone who didn't manage to watch the, the first two sessions in this series, they're available online. You can watch them and share them. This one will also be available online as so you can rewatch it and share it. Take notes down from some of the, the, the really good points that came out of this, really good suggestions from all our speakers. And so hoping as ever that this session has given everyone the confidence and the incentive to take on the architecture challenge and a sense also of some of the next steps towards positive change, which all of us needed to do the absolute best that we can uh, in the moment that we can do it. So the next webinar, the fourth uh, in the series, is going to be on the 28th of October, it's the end of next month, uh, looking in depth at the what, the why and the how of four building materials. So some of the ones we discussed today and a few others, we'll have a couple of sessions on building materials to look at them all a bit more in depth. Uh, so you can register on the Architecture Challenge website if you haven't done so already, and you'll have full details sent directly to you of the sessions that are coming up. Um, and you'll also then know when the design competition has launched and the full information there so you can take part. And we're also going to be offering certificates of attendance to anyone who's come to at least four of the webinars. So after the next one, those certificates will be available. Uh, and with that, it is thank you very much to everyone who, who joined us today for this session. 
Um, and huge thanks once again to Jane, to Hans, to Rebecca, and to Andrew. And, oh, in fact, here come some of the details on where you can find the challenge website. So it's challenge.infbau.org, very easy, and full information and details about the, um, the webinar series and the design competition on there, and following us on social media too, as is a great source of information. Um, so thanks once again to, to speakers and look forward to seeing everyone, I hope, on the 28th of October.